Hey yo, LAZ, after this episode, make sure you go check my bros over there at InSource TV and watch that Super Trife Low Life's interview part two with Face Low, you heard? Leave a comment, tell him Z-Man Suicide Polo with the Ski Man sent you. Hey yo, LAZ, man, if you need organic promo for your artists, your music, your brand, or your business, send me an email at thechenpopllc at gmail.com. Or hit me up at Real Saint Laz on Instagram. You heard? Hey yo, shout out to the bro Michael Lee Wood, aka Ohio Mike, one of the most dangerous prisoners in the history of Ohio State Corrections. You heard? Shout out to the bro Anytime TV for plugging us into the interview. He also plugged us in with that Chaos Loke interview. You heard? Shout out to the bro for letting us tap into that Ohio penitentiary history. But yeah, man, LAZ, make sure you hit that subscribe button. Make sure you hit that bell so you get a notification anytime I drop a new episode and you won't be out there lacking. You heard? Z-Man Suicide Polo with the Ski Man running around the hood like He-Man. Let's get it. And uh, by the time he woke up, I had tied it to my bars. I strapped the bomb on his back, put a gun to his, a zip gun to his head. And the first thing he said was, please don't kill me. I got a wife and four kids. And so I said, yeah, you should have thought about that for you talking all that motherfucking shit. Yeah, I come in at 18. And uh, I'm 64 years old now. I've been I've been down for uh, 45 and a half years since uh, March of '78. So I've been here for quite a few, and I've did most of my time here. Well, I did 17 here in the in the state of Ohio, and then uh, I did I caught some murder cases in the joint. And, and uh, it had, you know, bombs, bullets, and zip guns, and black powder, and all this other stuff. And then they gave me to the feds back in um, March of uh, 1995. Uh, matter of fact, uh, I went straight to the Supermax in uh, Colorado, the ADX. And uh, I spent 26 years in the feds, so, you know, I had the privilege, you know, of just yeah, you know, I just gravitated toward the, the real good dudes. So, you know, when I went to the ADX, you know, there was all the high profile dudes there that I got real cool with, like, um, um, <clears throat> Dr. Kerr, you know, I got pictures of us, me and Dr. Kerr, and, and, uh, as a matter of fact, Larry Hoover was my next door neighbor for six years at the ADX. Uh, and, you know, just a whole bunch of, you know, the, the cartel bosses, like, uh, Juan Brago and Juan Mata Belisarios and and uh, and even you know uh, even Barry Mills and them you know them, them dudes there which he ended up dying a few years ago and uh, you know he's the one to start that the uh, Aryan Brotherhood stuff in the old San Quentin back in 1968 and uh, uh, so I did a whole bunch of time out there in the feds and been all over the country. And then uh, <clears throat> I came back here to Ohio 20, is see, in March of uh, 21, because when I was out at um, Hazleton in West Virginia, I had the yard out there for four years. And then um, a new captain came in and said he was going to take back his yard because he said he thought I had too much control on the yard. So he put me in a hole and sent me out to. Uh, Victorville out there in California. It's, uh, it's on the high desert there. It's about 80 miles out of LA. But uh, before I left, I was able to put uh, a guy in charge of the yard. And when I say that, you know, everybody, all the gangs and, and uh, everybody else, they, they all have their shot callers. So when I say I'm in charge of the yard, I mean I'm in charge for all the white dudes. And uh, I'm the shot caller for them. So I put a dude named Freddie Gears in charge of the yard, which I had him running the on one side of the yard for me when I couldn't get over on that side. And um, so I go out to um, Victorville. I'm out there about two, a little over two years, and um, then they bring in uh, uh, 
Scotty Bulger, you know what I'm talking about, right? The big yeah. snitch from Boston. Yeah. Well, they bring him into into uh, Hazleton around about 11.30 at night, and then early in the morning, Freddie G's and a couple, uh, two other uh, Boston guys go over to his block and kill him, strangle him, you know, beat him up, and uh, put a sheet over him, put him in bed. Well, when they do their big investigation because it's a high profile prisoner, you know, like Whitey Bulger, uh, then somehow, you know, like whatever played out, the administration told him, well, because they was asking, how did these guys get over to this block when they're on the other side of the, of the, uh, the prison? And uh, then they tell him, well, Freddie G's was in charge of the yard, you know, and then they said that Mike Wood put him in charge of the yard when he left. And uh, because my name came up, uh, Washington, the BOP in Washington, said I was, uh, since I was uh, um, a state prisoner just being housed in the feds, they said I was persona non grata and sent me back to Ohio to take me back. So that's why I came back. And now I've been back here in this Supermax in Ohio, in Youngstown, for two and a half years now. Why did they send you to the feds? Why they sent you to the feds from Ohio in the first place? Well, I had two murders in prison at Lucasville, the, the maximum security prison. I had two murders there, uh, you know, whole, like five or five or six different stabbings, which, you know, I could have took their lives, but I chose not to kill them because it wasn't, wasn't things where you just had to kill them, you know, just take a body part or something. And, uh... And I, you know, they got me for, um, mainly because I was embarrassing the, the state because, um, you know, uh, when they, when I got my last murder case, they told me, you're never getting out. You're never going to be in, uh, see general population ever again. I said, all right, well then, uh, send me somewhere where I can start over and get out of population because I'm doing a life sentence and this is not going to work. I'm not going to accept this. They said, well, I don't know what to tell you, you know, you're going to be back here for the rest of your bit. So then I started, uh, you know, like took a guard hostage, tied it to my bars, uh, put a gun to his head, and, you know, and that's about all I did. I didn't try to hurt him or try to kill him or nothing like that. And, uh, um, you know, they, um, uh, making bombs. You was, you was formally charged for huh? both of those murders in the pen, though? charge with one and then I went to a four day outside trial and got found guilt uh not guilty by self defense and the other one I wasn't even charged before. The self defense the one charges I've had. Yeah. The self defense yeah, one, been, uh, what went down? What happened with like what happened? Uh well it was a it was a, a big uh uh well let's see there was a gang, you know, this white gang in here named the Brotherhood back in those days, because they had 38 guys in their clique. And, uh, uh make a long story short on that, the, the one that was running the, the gang was a dude named Billy Murphy. And he was a bad gambler, so he would always go out there and end up losing money in the day room and stuff. And he owed this other white guy a bunch of money. And rather than paying, he sent two guys to go stab him up and try to kill him. But he ended up surviving from it. <clears throat> well, he had a little uh, younger friend named Teeters. And he was in the local control. He was getting out in a few, few weeks, like six weeks or something like that. So this guy grew up with my partners. You know, well, he didn't grow up with my, like my partners knew his mother and father grew up with them. And, and uh, we had heard that um, that Billy Murphy was going to make have a move made, made made on him when he came out of the local truck, you know, to get him out of the way because where I, you know, where we come from here in Ohio, you know, you make moves on dudes and make moves on your partners. So uh, we heard that, and then Benny was saying that grew up with these guys, mother and father on the streets, said, yeah, I can't let nothing happen to this kid. Fucking, you know, I've, I've known him up all my life, and blah, 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 blah. And so um, we went and talked to Billy Murphy, at the chow hall the next day that he, he had got that word. And the dude said, oh yeah, yeah, and Benny, cause Benny said, look, this kid ain't, 
he ain't gonna do nothing to you. You got my word, and I think this kid's going home in a few months, and I'm gonna make sure he goes home. Uh, and the dude says, oh yeah, yeah, that's cool. But anyway, he when he leaves, he tells some of his gang members, like, man, fuck them guys. Uh, they, they, you know, they think they run this fucking joint, but uh, I'm gonna show them otherwise. I'm gonna make a move on him. If they don't like that motherfucker, I'm gonna make a move on him too. And, uh, but one of their gang members, was booked down in the gym with us and he come and seen us. He said, hey, listen, man, I know this is going to be a big clusterfuck right here. And this guy's, you know, he said he's going to make a move on you guys because this dude knew what was going to happen. Them dudes were all going to get clowned and uh, he didn't want to be part of that. So he told us everything about it. And uh, anyway, so when we go to our wreck that night, we go down strapped and everything and, and, uh, <clears throat> The dude comes up and, and uh, so anyway, a, a, a big old fight breaks out with, with uh, a bunch of their gang members. But we, we brought a bunch of convicts in with us, you know, independent guys that are not picked up. And uh, so there's a big fight going on down there. And then uh, I, I take uh, uh, Billy Murphy hits Benny through the hand where he raises his hand up to block a knife from going in his chest. So I attacked the dude, uh, Billy Murphy, the, the leader of this trick. And uh, anyway, but as we fall down the, the, the uh, bleachers, I get on top of him and then I, I, I stick him through the heart. And, uh, and uh, I ended up killing him. Well, he didn't die for about a week because what I did was I, when I hit him through the heart, I set, severed his aorta that pumps blood up to the brain. So when he, when they put him on life flight, uh, they they cut him open and sewed his heart up and was fibrillated all the way back to the hospital, put him on life flight. I mean, uh, put him on, uh, uh, what do you call that when they put all them machine, uh, machines on you stuff, keep you alive. Life support. Life support, yeah, yeah. So they put him on life support and then a week later, they say, uh, you know, this dude ain't never coming back. He's got the uh, metal uh, thing of a burnout light bulb, basically what they were saying. So they, they called some people in and gave him a parole right there in the hospital and said, uh, he's yours now. We, we paroled him to, to his family. What do you want to do? They said, uh, pull the plug. So they pulled the plug. He went into cardiac arrest and died. And then they charged us. They charged, actually they charged me one of my partners is on the streets right now, uh, BT, and they charged Benny Fields. That's another one of my partners. He went on to the streets about 15 years ago, but he died of a heart attack. And uh, so they, they gave us a four-day trial, come back like 40 minutes later and found us all three not guilty to self-defense. Uh, so, you know, that's, they can't do nothing about that one. And... Uh, then after we got out, which was 13 months later, we got back out in population. And uh, I'm walking down the hallway with my celly. And uh, one of these goofballs tries to make a move, but everybody stays strapped in, in, in Lucasville. And uh, he tries to make a move. You have so, one minute remaining. So when he pulls his weapon, I pull mine. And so I ended up getting out on him in the, in the, uh, in the, in the hallway. And this cam, you know, cameras are out there anyway. So, so when they say it's a self defense because he tried to sneak up on me, it's right on camera and fucking, I blocked his little shit and fucking, I ended up stabbing him to death. So I didn't even get indicted on that one. That was that was in uh in Ohio at Lucasville. That was back in uh, that was in January of '89, and then we went to trial in November of '89. So did and then you? I caught another that other murder case in '90. 90 after I got out because we got out of the patrol unit in February of 90 and then that happened in September of 90. Let me ask yeah. you this. So you, you were never yeah. involved in none of those white gangs? You was always an independent? I'm always independent, yeah. I've never been in a tip in my life. That was both two two people from the Brotherhood that you killed in self-defense? They called their gang the Brotherhood. But they weren't the AP, you know, as you know, they were just a white uh, gang, you know, a bunch of white guys that hung around each other and tipped up. Oh, they was a whole different gang remember. just called the Brotherhood that was existing in Ohio uh, only? Yeah, they were just called the 
other. That's just the name they had, but they weren't never they weren't A B dudes as you know, as you know nowadays. What do you think was worse? Ohio State Penitentiary or the Feds? Well, that's a trick question because like everything, you know, and if you did time, you know, like there's always good and there's always bad. I like I like I, I like Ohio because you can just stand on your own, you know, like you don't have to be responsible for nobody else if you don't want to be, you know, other than maybe your partners or something like that. But you don't have to be responsible for everybody else. In the feds, you know, like you, like since I'm a white guy, you come in, you're res- you're in a way you're responsible for all them. For instance, like if 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 someone if you're on the yard and a white dude's getting jumped by, you know, a black dude or a Spanish dude or something, you're forced, you're forced into helping that dude. You have to go help that dude. Same thing if a black dude's getting jumped by a white dude. White blacks are forced to go help that dude because see if you don't. Because the politics is this way. If you don't, then your career is over with. You know, you're going to be beat off of every yard you ever go to. And uh, and and if you keep coming back to the yards and they have to beat you off, then the next thing you go, they're going to stab you or kill you. Depends on which yard you go on. You know, some of them are more serious than others. But I don't like the politics that way because, you know, that's why I've never been in a kid because I'm not, I don't want to hurt anybody that doesn't deserve it, you know, just because some idiot's in a clique and he goes talking shit or disrespecting some good fucking convict, I don't want to have to go kill this dude because he puts his dude in the mouth where he kicked his ass, you know, and beat him down real bad and, you know, then I'm going to, I don't want to have to go hurt this dude because he was in the right. Yeah. I don't like those federal politics either. Like, know what I mean, I don't want to. I don't. I don't. I don't know what another dude is doing, but when I'm not looking, that could cause right. problems for the whole, for the whole car. Man, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So when, when was the when was the first time you was ever in jail? First time of probably twelve. Yeah, I did a lot of lot of juvenile time. Juvenile time, then I went to graduate from juvenile, went to the reformatory. Got bounced over as an adult, went to the uh, reformatory when I was 16 or 17. And uh, then got out, was out, out on the streets for four and a half months, caught a murder case, and, and here we are 45 and a half years later. What what part of Ohio are you from? Ken, uh, from the Football Hall of Fame, that. And what, how did you end up in the streets in the first place? Like, what was going on in your household? Oh, well, not a, not a whole lot. I, I didn't, uh, I didn't, you know, I didn't have anybody, you know, I didn't have no, uh, no parents to, to really keep an eye on me and, or, or really give a shit, you know, as far as, uh, as far as, you know, um, how you say it, uh, you know, caring about what you do for the most part. You know, it didn't matter if I come in, whatever time I came in, I came in and nobody paid it any attention. Like, was it drugs in your household or alcohol abuse or what was it that your parents yeah. wasn't really involved? Yeah, it was, uh, there was no drugs. No drugs. As a matter of fact, I don't even, I don't do drugs, I don't drink. And, uh, and my father, though, my father was a quiet alcoholic. My mother, um, she just worked like two jobs all the time, so she never had time to do, uh, do much anyway other than work to try to, you know, because she had eight kids, so she had to support them because my father, uh, he was, you know, he would come and go for, you know, he, like he might be there one day and gone for two years, you know, go up like in the Maine and stuff where he was originally born, and, and uh, so he was never around. But, uh, you know, other than that, you know, this was a way of life, you know. You, I lived in the projects most of my life, you know. Well, we lived in the projects. And, uh, you know, it was, it was good times, you know, when I was out there. I, just, I had nobody to show me how to do the right thing. 
which you know kept me running the streets at night with the crew I was running the streets with, and we'd always end up getting into something. They had a juvenile state system out there. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you, um, the first time I did time it was like twelve. I went to what they call juvenile diagnostic center up in up in Columbus, Ohio. Then I've been to you know the mall me outside of Toledo, Ohio, and and uh, you know like a whole bunch of them, like a lot of them, different ones. And then uh, then a couple times from them, they would send me to juvenile group homes to, you know, spend five, six months there or something. I'd end up taking off from them. And, but yeah, yeah, a lot of, a lot of juvenile joints. They got like a, a county jail, like Rikers Island, New York got Rikers Island. How is their county jail? Well, I haven't been in that county jail since 78, but when I was there, um, I was, I, again, I was, I was just fucking young, stupid, and violent. And uh, so when I went into the county jail, uh, see, I, I ended up catching my case well, actually, I caught my case when I was 17, but when I got caught, I was 18. So, you know, I was, I, then I was an adult. And uh, so when I went into the county jail, uh, you know, I was pretty violent in there. And I ended up uh, hurting some dudes, you know, I guess too many at one time. And then they locked me up for a while by myself. I couldn't be around anybody. And then, but it was dudes to come in and, and uh, you know, plus I was young, and then I guess they thought that, you know, that they had a, uh, well, I guess they thought they had an even, uh, an even match or whatever, you know, I guess they thought, they thought they were going to fight, but I wasn't even thinking about fighting, I was thinking about killing them, you know, back then, and so when they, you know, like, talk shit or, or, or thinking about they was just going to get in the fist up so I'd put that steel to them. And then I found it in the county jail. And most of them are broke weak once you, you know, once they got a bite of that steel, they didn't want no more of it. Or the pipe, cause, you know, I had a pipe too. But yeah, those were, those were, those were some interesting times. What do you think made you violent in the first place? Uh, I don't know, man. Just, just the way I grew up in the juvenile joints, you know, Listen, I've been in the juvenile joints, uh, and I tell dudes this when I talk to them every now and then. I've been in some juvenile joints that are way harder than fucking, that were way harder than some of the prisons I've been in. Because, you know, kids can be vicious motherfuckers when they're young. And uh, we were, you know. We didn't, we, I, we didn't understand what it meant to, you know, do the things that we were doing and the ramifications behind it. We had no clue that... Some of the stuff you look back on and say, damn, I could have got easily killed over that. But you're not even thinking that when you're a kid. You just, it's the immediate what, you, what you're uh, thinking about. So you've been locked up on this case since 17 years old? Yeah, well, I, I didn't get caught until I was 18. But you've been in the, in the oh. penitentiary since 18 years old and you've been down for 45 years? Yeah, I come in at 18, and uh, I'm 64 years old now. That, that's insane. Why did they give you that much time, and how could they legally give you that much time at, a, well, at that because, age? Well, because I, I, was, I was 18 when I come in. And it, that, that's the law back then, and, and I got a life sentence for a murder case. And uh, actually, I had a partner with me, and we both got... Uh, we got both got life sentences, and uh, he he did twenty eight years and kicked out. He's been out like sixteen, seventeen years now. And uh, but he was cool when he was in joint. You know me, I was always you know I was you know I had the stabbings. I've had taken like I like I'll give you an example. Like one time I was up on a range, and they moved me from Lucasville to another joint, and put me in the hole in the back of the, and they built a special door for the, in the back six sales on the top range where only I could be or you know the guards had to open it up to get to my cell 
where they didn't want to be around nobody. And uh, so there was this one guard, uh, big tall motherfucker. I used to call him Pizza Face because he had all these pop marks on his face, but he was a ex cop on the streets. And uh, so he used to come up there every half hour and he had to look in, on my, in my cell, you know, see me. And so one, he used to look at me like I got some piece of shit. So one day I asked him, this was back in March of uh, 92. So I asked him, I said, hey, let me ask you something, man. You know me or something? You know me from somewhere? Because every time you look at me, you look like I, look at me like I'm some piece of shit or something. And he, and he stopped in front of my cell. He said, I used to be a, I used to be a cop on the streets. I used to put folks like you in jail. Now I'm out here babysitting you. Well, then I find out that he was you know, that he was mad because he had a good job in another block. But they told him that him and another guy who was an ex-military uh, dude, they had to come over here to this hole, and their, their job was to keep an eye on me. So I told him, I said, well, listen, okay, so now I'm, a, now I'm a bump, right? I said, well, let me tell you, next time I get ready to do something, you're going to be my victim. How about that? And he just looked at me and walked on. And we had no words. It took me five and a half months to get him, but then you know, I snatched his ass up from my bars and knocked him out. And uh, by the time he woke up, I had tied him to my bars. I strapped a bomb on his back, put a gun to his, a zip gun to his head. And the first thing he said was, please don't kill me, I got a wife and four kids. And so I said, yeah, you should have thought about that for you talking all that motherfucking shit. So I just bloodied his mouth and nose up and stuff. And then they brought a negotiator in by that time. You have one minute remaining. And uh, they were like, let him do it, let him go. So I said, man, I'm tired of hearing your voice. I'm going to let this motherfucker go. You come on in and take his place. That motherfucker said, I'm, I'm not lying to you, I'm not coming in. I said, well, shut the fuck up then. He ain't coming out either. How y'all was making bombs? I was, I was making bombs because I was getting in black powder, smokeless powder. Then I was taking my... Uh, like when they they take me off the record, I'd, I'd, I'd secrete like those pebbles and stuff in my sock and bring them back in and I'd take the syrup and put the syrup outside of my bomb and then I'd attach these, uh, these stones to it and I'd put uh, bullets, you know, bullets inside the uh, black powder or smokeless powder, whatever I have inside and then I would make my fuse by putting holes through uh, uh, match heads. Then I would like, take the syrup from the morning tray when they have syrup, and I put that out on outside. You know, I'll stick it gets it hard. So then I attach these rocks to the outer outside of the strap mill, and then I would you know put bullets, uh, 22s, 38s. I usually like the 22s because they're rim fire rather than the 38s, which I've had plenty of them too. But they're hard. They're hard to go on. You know, and they're dangerous if you don't have the right. Uh, zip gun to use because they, they got that firepower to them and plus you got to use like a nail or something because they're you know uh, you got to hit them right in the middle in order to make those things go off or at least with the 22s you know you can put them in a in like a pipe or anything and you know and it's, they're easy they're easy to go off anyway um, um, and I would take uh, matches and then I would put holes through the matches and uh, cut the stems off and have a string of uh, match heads and then, you know, light them and test it, you know, 1,001, 1,002, 1, 000, just like that. And make sure that I get like a two or a four second fuse or something like that. And once I got enough of them like that, I know that when I put it on here, then it's going to blow in four seconds or two seconds or however long I want it. And that's how I used to make my... Uh, my wick, if I didn't have an actual wick, which most of the time I didn't, I had to make the wick myself. So was it ever a time in your history in Ohio where a prisoner actually shot another prisoner with a zip gun? Well, no, because, uh, well, uh, no, no, the only, only, the only, the only uh, one that I, I can tell you about now is um, that in Lucasville opened up in uh, November 1972. I didn't get there until 78. And uh, in 
in in uh, 73, a guy ended up getting a, a, a regular gun in. And uh, he uh, took a guard hostage. He took a guard hostage on the range, way in the back of the range. And uh, <clears throat> so they, they uh, you know, they bring in a sniper and everything. He's up in the front of the range with a sniper. This guy's in the back with his gun uh, on the guard and threatening the shooting and stuff like that. Well, they, they ended up telling the guard, the sniper, to take the, the shooting. And uh, so he gets beat on, but he don't shoot the dude. He, he, shoot, he, he ends up trying to shoot him. They shoot the other, he shoots the guard and kills the guard. So they get rainy and they, they, they you know, lock him up for the, that right there. And, uh, and then later, um, uh, after that, well, he got lucky because right after he did that, they threw the death penalty out. If you remember, they threw it out in 72 and they threw it out back in 78. So he didn't get no death penalty over that stuff. Well, later on, the other guards, they find out who brought the gun into him, which was another guard that he had paid to bring the gun in. They caught that guard, one of the, guard, one of the other guards went down to a, a bar where the guy was at, went in, shot and killed him. That, that officer got uh, seven to 15 years for, for killing him. And then- uh, What you mean, another officer- suicide. Another officer took revenge on the uh, a CO who, who smuggled the gun in. Yeah, yeah, took the revenge on him, and he got he got he went into a bar and killed him, and then he went to court and got seven to twenty five years for it. And uh, then the, the sniper who ended up killing the the guard that was hostage, he ended up committing suicide. Dang. So it was a big old. Entangled weave there, you know. And then Rainey, they sent him to, they sent him out of state because of that, because they couldn't put him on death row, because they, they just did away with death row. So they sent him out of state to uh, Nevada, no, let's see, to, to uh, uh, Arizona at first. And then I heard years later, he got stabbed and stabbed up real bad by somebody down there. And then he went to Nevada and I don't know what happened to him. He might even be dead now, as far as all I know. I don't know what happened to him now. It, his, his, uh, his last, his, his, his name was Rainey. Rainey. R-A-I-N-E, -I, I, I think. N -E, see, R-A-I-N-E-Y, something like that. This picture with all the people in it, what's that? The, that's the white car in the feds? That's just the guys that were under me at Victorville. Those were all the dudes that that uh that were under me at, at well that was all the all the white guys, but most a lot of them that were in the picture. Yeah, that was at Victorville back in I don't know, two thousand fifteen or whatever. And that's you in the but, front? Uh, yeah, that's me in the front. Everybody else gathered around me. <laughs> Yeah, bro, but nah, these pictures are fire, though. You said they sent you to the feds just because they couldn't handle you? Because Ohio, the state, couldn't handle you? Right, right. They, that, and that they were getting politically embarrassed because, like, they would come and shake me down, and they would, like, say, like, they would find uh, uh, bullets sold into my mattress or... Uh, black powder or whatever the case are, or up in the workings up the top, top of the door, I would have like two loaded zip guns up there and stuff, and they'd take it all apart and find zip guns up there. Well, all that stuff got in the news and stuff, and what it was, it was just a political embarrassment for the state of Ohio saying, look at, how can this dude, this dude's running your fucking prisons for you. This dude's getting guns in and putting live ammunition, and then they, 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 they would, uh, uh, like, they arrested one guard for bringing me bullets in his, in his Frito bag, and he tried to give them to another guy to get them to me, and that guy told on him, so they, they arrested him with some bullets in his Frito bag, and then he ended up saying they were for me, and fucking ended up doing two years over it, and the snitch went to, to the, to Warren, where they 
you know, it's a one joint they put on a on a high point on you know, on the ranch period. And uh yeah, it was just a big old cluster buck, so you know, they were still taxing me for what I did all those years ago, even though I had been gone for so long. And being cool. They were like, No, you still you you were violent and uh you were, you you can't be around other staff and you can't be around staff and other prisoners because you're a predator and you know, you you've done this and that and and uh, you know, the murder cases and the stabbings and the bombs and the bullets and the taking the guard hostage and and then I even got a hacksaw blades in it and and literally here at, at, at Lucasville, Ohio, I literally sawed the door off, took the whole took the door off the hinges. You know, and, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I took the whole fucking door off and sent it out on the range. And then they built a new joint in Mansfield, which had these big ass steel doors on them, and in the control unit there, sent, I was one of the first five guys went there, and they fucked around and put these old heavy ass 300 pound steel beds in the floor there. So, anyway, make a long story short on that, there's a lot of shit happen with the, but, well, this is not Lucasville, we don't pamper our prisoners, this and that. So, uh, I told dudes, I said, hey, let's fuck this motherfucker. And, and so we kicked the beds off the floor and got them off and, and uh, ran the doors with them 300 pound fucking beds and literally took the uh, doors off the hinges, from, you know, from the other side, not not the door where you actually open it up to come out, but the other side where the hinges are at, we knocked them off the hinges that came out there and fought the police. Hmm. So they're just taxing me for all that shit, you know, because, listen, I mean, uh, Jordan knows pretty well that there's nobody has done as much as I have done in, in this whole state, period. I was the first person in Ohio history ever sent to the feds disciplinary. Uh, there's only two of us that have two murders apiece in a joint other than riot-related stuff, because, you know, we had the big big riot in uh, 93 where I took, it over, took the joint over for 11 days and there was the longest riot in U.S. history um, but nobody has done as much as I just far as bombs, bullets and everything like that I just was smart enough to know that I kept all that stuff to myself to use it if I wanted to use it but I didn't pass it out which I threatened to pass it out plenty of times just to make them motherfuckers nervous but you know, I wasn't going to pass it out to get somebody that didn't, you know, that didn't deserve to die, end up getting killed because some idiot used one of my, you know, one of my bullets and shot a motherfucker in the head or something. Mm-hmm. So I never passed out any ammunition to anybody else. Yeah, I got a, I got a partner too. Well, actually, like my, he was, uh, we, we grew up together on the streets, and. The last time I saw him was 14 years old. And so I haven't seen him in like 51 years, you know. And we just started touching base in the last year that I've been back here. Uh, we, we reconnected and everything. And, and I usually call him every night and stuff. That's just like when I was doing something for Unique. You know, he would like read the comments to me and stuff like that. Or, or I have a copy of it for he could play it to me over the phone and stuff like that. See how, you know, see if it sounded right. You know, I was mm-hmm. always little critical on you know, some of the stuff that goes on. I wanted to make sure that everything was right. I see you had a joint with Unique Mecca Audio. You was locked up with him? Yeah, yeah. We, I knew I knew Unique from the uh, from uh, ADX. I, knew, I met him in like 96. We, were, we went through the program together at this federal supermax in Colorado. And uh, matter of fact, uh, like Santa he tells, uh Tell Jordan and everybody. He told him on the on the uh, tapes that he did. Like I'm the one that, because uh, he couldn't really read read and write real good stuff. I'm the one taught them guys, him and, and a bunch of other guys, uh, how to you know just sit down and try to teach them how to read and write and stuff like that. And he had his law stuff and everything. So I took I took his law stuff down to where I worked and and we typed it typed it out for him and stuff like that for he could put the stuff in court. So yeah, we got we got cool there. I mean, we wasn't we were partners or nothing like that, or real, real, real good friends. But he was convict, and so I looked out for convicts. You know, when they need, you know, something like that, I felt that you know, my guy should have the opportunity to get back in court. So anyway, I took it down there and tacked all this legal stuff out for him, and 
that's how we got to know each other. So I I thought that that you know he wanted me to do a few things for him on his uh, podcast. So I'm like, you know, I did that, you know, as as his friend, you know, to see, well, if you don't get this, can I have something up for you? That's all well and good. It don't cost me nothing to sit here and and and, and uh, say whatever I'm saying, you know, whatever you want me to talk about. 